Let's see. This is uh, Pelogia, who has a cartoon of himself with a whole lot more muscles than he really has. But that's okay. Yeah, who would ever idealize their cartoon form? He looked at my daughter. He looked at me. I wasn't about to help him. I thought, wow, this is going to be good. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. So, but you spend your whole program poking holes in Christians and Christianity. That's what Apologia does, examining the claims of Christians as a former Christian. And usually that means claims about science. He always picks on Ken Ham, ham and egg, he calls it, answers in Genesis. History, philosophy, sociology, or theology. But today, I'm adding an entry to my Creation for Cash series where I look behind the scenes at the conduct and activity of a creation ministry. Specifically today, Kent Hovind's Dinosaur Adventureland compound in Lenox, Alabama. It's been exactly a year since my last update on Kent. Any more questions from Pelogia? Uh, send them on, guys. That was a year ago. When we were awaiting a verdict on his $500 million lawsuit against the U.S. government. Something just as ridiculous as it sounds. And while Kent's antics in the past could seem like something to snicker at for entertainment, as he was most often hurting himself, like the rest of the planet, Kent's world got dark in 2020 and 2021, and it's not so silly anymore. To be clear, this video is not an ad hominem attack toward Kent's thoughts about human origins. Nothing we talk about today has any impact at all on the truth or non-truth of his ideas about creation, evolution, and the age of the earth. There's a library of existing and future videos to refute those. And some of you may wonder why I have a Creation for Cash series at all. This is an ideas channel, not a drama channel. Well, unfortunately, the damage done by Creation Ministries isn't limited to pseudoscience and indoctrination. Far too often, they are financially defrauding people under false pretenses and doing direct and indirect physical harm as well. Here's the voice of Kent's third wife, Cindy, expressing her concerns. Their motive is the continuation of the income stream from donors like me who require the false impression that they are donating to godly men. While this ministry helps many believe the Bible is scientifically accurate, it is abundantly evidenced that the men who presently run this ministry are unfaithful, unscrupulous, and unworthy of such donations from the sacrificial giving of well-meaning donors. Donors won't give if they see the truth that Kent Hovind, his godless behavior, his unchristian behavior has cost him three marriages to three godly women who loved him and served this ministry with all their hearts. This is Con Artist 101, so you can steal my money and throw me out the door like trash. I know there are many Christians and young earth creationists in my audience, and if any of you are still supporting Kent Hovind financially? I hope that after watching this, you'll consider putting that kingdom investment elsewhere. I have absolutely nothing to be ashamed of with my behavior, and if you want to make it public, we can do that. All right, let's go. Now, while I keep my finger on the pulse of what Kent is up to day to day, his last year has been particularly jam-packed and complicated, so I wanted to bring in a more vigilant Hovind watchdog, Atheist Jr., or AJ. It's funny because Kent, when I debated him, the first thing he asked me was like, he wanted to know my name and why he couldn't see me. And I was telling him, I was like, it's AJ. <laughs> he, he was he, that frustrated him. So Bill, this is the pacifier, AJ, that keeps you guys believing this. <laughs> There's a lot to get through. And to keep things somewhat organized, we're going to navigate the year in roughly chronological order. But it's probably best to start with a quick introduction of the cast of characters. Who is this uneducated huckster, Kent Hoven? So Kent is the patriarch of creation science evangelism. It's his ministry, and he is basically the person who is at the highest level of authority at Dinosaur Adventureland, which is his Christian theme park. Or as I call it, the abandoned sandbox. Is this a sad abandoned sandbox? Oh, no. Pelogia, you've never been here. 
you have no idea what you're talking about. I would suggest you shut your mouth. The only dinosaur-themed attraction that makes Jurassic Park seem not so problematic. After careful consideration, I've decided not to endorse your park. So have I. And he is a Baptist preacher, a radical right-wing Republican. He's somebody who's basically a, a tax protester. He spent decades not paying income taxes. Allegedly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is associated with people who are sovereign citizens. And a definition for sovereign citizen is effectively people who think they're above the law, basically. The power structure at DAL and CSE, it starts with Kent Hovind, and then you have Ernie Land. If you want to help financially with the ministry, get a hold of Ernie. He handles all the money, trustee. Somebody that's been friends with Kent for over 20 years. He appears to be the one who's controlling the finances and controlling the donations at CSE. He is also a sovereign citizen. He still has a multi-level marketing company now. Or will you take the risk that rewards you by defining you as being successful? And then there's the third person in the power structure of CSE. That's Steve. The Amazon people told Steve, our tech guy, they said, you're going to have to sue them and get a judge's order to make them stop. Like Stephen Lynn. Steve is Kent's IT guy, although he's not exactly very good at IT. <laughs> well, there's technical problems with the camera. We're working on it, right, Steve? Yes. You're going to be able to save them? I mean, I guess somebody has to do it because if you've ever seen Kent try to use a computer on his own, it's pretty hopeless. Like... <laughs> <laughs> according to evolution, things get better automatically, you know. Well, no, according to evolution, you know, things get better automatically. You would think it would happen with uh, computers. I mean, they're simple compared to a human cell. <sighs> according to evolution, things get better automatically. And Steve gets whatever he wants, basically. In his home, he has high-end gaming PCs. He has fancy camera equipment. He drives a really nice lifted Jeep that has custom paint job and stuff on this and like a nice interior, all this stuff. You have sort of tiers of people who are at DAL. They come and go, and usually you have probably about 45 to maybe 60 people there total. You know, families, that number can fluctuate. Including people like Mark Stoney, Theo from Lies of the Devil, and others who have left and gone on to expose the day-to-day -day abuses happening there. And then we have the parade of women that Kent calls wives. So we have the OG wife who's not exactly relevant to this whole situation, Joe Hovind. Okay, this is not my wife. That's just a picture of her. They were married for decades and then they got divorced. Mary, in the presence of God and these assembled witnesses, do you promise to love and to cherish the man who stands across from you now? I do. Then immediately Kent married Mary Toko. Basically, she left Kent when she learned of his continued financial recklessness. She worried that there would be a similar raid by the IRS and the federal government, just like in Pensacola. And she didn't want what happened to Joe to happen to her, which I think is fair. All right. Let's see. Tell them your name and where you're from. Cindy Hoven. Cindy Hoven. Wow. OK. Mm -hmm. You finally married the boss just to try to get out of work. Did that help? <laughs> didn't help, did it? He did not marry the boss to get out of work. Oh, OK. All right. Cindy was the third wife of Kent. And I'm just going to call them wives or ex-wives because I don't want to get into the whole was he actually married to this person thing. It's just easier to say wife number one, wife number two, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So Cindy Lincoln was friends with Mary Toko. After Mary Toko split up with Kent, she moved to Repton, Alabama to be at what she thought was a Christian ministry where she could serve God. And she fell in love with a persona that Kent was presenting, but it was not the actual person that Kent was, which Joe Hovind has said was the same thing that happened to her. And after suffering abuse at Kent's hands and financial manipulation and emotional manipulation and who knows what else, she left Kent and she publicly exposed him. All the skeptics are going to get mad. Oh, and got married again. Yeah. Wife number four, we don't really know very much about yet. He presented his new wife, Sandra, and kisses her on camera. And Kent says, Cindy, should have been yours. You blew it. Just as a way to really stick it to Cindy and insult her and try and upset her. Okay, so when last we posted on Kent Hovind, it was to outline his half a billion dollar lawsuit against the U.S. government. 
He said, Kent Hovind sues U.S. government for half a billion dollars. That is correct. Okay, the suit has been filed and accepted, and now they have to deal with the questions in the suit. This all really is dating back to when Kent first got arrested and went to court for 45 counts of structuring for not withholding Social Security and FICA taxes for his employees and for impeding the work of the IRS officers and effectively like threatening them. So Kent basically felt like I was innocent back then. I haven't broken any laws. That's why that website, Kent Hovind is innocent, I think is great. I didn't break any laws. And not only was I innocent of all those things, I'm actually going to sue the government for unlawful kidnapping, armed robbery. I wasn't bothering anybody. I'm sitting there getting ready for Bible study and they come in with a SWAT team and 20 armed SWAT team members and arrested me. That's why this is all on my video number five. And when they came and arrested me, they said, get every DVD number five you can find. They put me in prison. He went down and seized the church ministry bank account, seized all of the properties, put them in the name of the government. They got a safe in Joe Hoven's room that had $17,000 in it cash that they, they seized. They took Kent and Joe off to jail, obviously, which he is calling, you know, kidnapping and breaking and entering. All of those things uh, are in the, uh, the documents. So he's suing like the judge that sentenced him. He's suing his own lawyer from back then. Just everybody who was involved, basically. Every, it was everyone's fault except his, of course. So he's suing the government for half a billion dollars because what he claimed was that the judge in the case said to him that I'm extending it to the maximum sentence of 10 years. And so Kent's justification for the ridiculous price tag on his lawsuit is that they enhanced my sentence for structuring from zero to six months, which is what structuring normally carries. Anyway, so we thought the lawyers thought it would be pro appropriate to enhance the demands for damages from normal 30, 40 million to 500 million. And the details of all that are covered in my video from last October called Kent Hovind Sues for 500 Million, a Movie, and a Pocket Knife. And the posting time of that video is where we're going to pick up the Dinosaur Adventureland story, because little did we know that while we were awaiting a verdict, Kent's third wife, Cindy, was in trouble. In October 2020, this body slam incident happened, and I can say with certainty that this happened because Kent has now been found guilty of slamming Cindy. Now, he's been going around to comment sections, posting a link to an audio file that he recorded during this incident. And I've heard it. I refuse to play it on my channel because honestly, I found it very disturbing. For some reason, Kent thinks that this recording makes him seem innocent. To me, it's the exact opposite because... Kent is a six foot one man and Cindy is a fairly timid and short woman. And you can hear her in what appears to be pain. And it wasn't simply the recording that was the only evidence presented in court because Cindy went to both a doctor and a chiropractor. Now, Kent claims that she was trying to grab at his cell phone, which he was recording the audio on. And she can be a sweet, loving Cindy one minute and hitting me the next. She's hit me many times. I've never hit her one time. Okay. She hit me in anger many times. I've never been physically violent to any woman. Because, of course, Kent is always innocent. He claimed that she attacked him, dove at him, and that he just got out of the way and, like, pushed her out of the way and that she crashed into the ground. To my ears, that part of the recording, after the noises from the violence, which I won't play, sounds like Kent is performing in an old school radio play. Like he's acting for a future audience, rather than actually showing care to Cindy. Michael is on vacation, and he's asked me to record all meetings and to type up the transcripts. Okay. Uh, Karen, any news from that law firm? Yeah, the deal closed yesterday. It's a six-month commitment. Oh my god, Dwight, what are you doing? What? You're not allowed to take off your pants in the middle of the office. Kent has been saying that he was recording her because he was told by his lawyer to record Cindy during all of her violent outbursts and that he had 600 recordings of her. But for some reason, the only recording that was played in court was that one. So it's almost like that was just a big lie and that he didn't have 600 recordings of her. Well, we'll come back to the aftermath of that part of the story 
And now we'll move on to January 2021. When I was doing my interview with Cindy, she was talking about uh, her experience renting a house to Steve at Dinosaur Adventureland. When I thought Steve was still maybe good, I rented him my, my rental property. And basically, she didn't feel like he was a very good renter and things went south and Steve was arguing with her. And Cindy is alleging because she admits that she can't be sure. And comes back a minute later with his right hand in his right pocket. I know Steve has guns. I knew exactly what was going on. It was concealed. I didn't see it. I can't prove it but he was effing threatening me with a gun. I went home, I told my husband, honey, I think Steve just threatened me with a gun. My husband did nothing, nothing. And Kent didn't seem to really care much about it, which is odd because you would think most husbands would get up and have words with that person. You know what I mean? They'd be upset by it. But Kent was fairly indifferent to it. And it shows to me that at that point, Kent cared more about Steve than Cindy, in my opinion. And then finally, closure on the big lawsuit. In April, after a lot of back and forth with court filings and extensions, the judge finally recommended that Kent's half a billion dollar lawsuit be thrown out with prejudice so that he cannot file it again because Kent, he likes to file a lot of frivolous lawsuits. This is what he did to the IRS back in 2005. And back then there were audio recordings of Kent talking on the phone in jail. And he basically said that he's just going to sue them as many times as he can just to antagonize them. About the only thing we got going for us is Scott Snyder is a little bit afraid that I will sue him. And I will. Amen. I'll do it again. (laughs) And the rest of his life. If he doesn't start obeying the law, I'm going to haunt him the rest of his life. So the judge called the lawsuit frivolous and delusional. Amazing. So there's nothing Kent can do anymore. Except lie on camera and say, it's not over yet. When the lawsuit had been thrown out, Kent was still going on his channel and making videos acting like the case was still going on. So right now, the judge is looking at it longer than normal, trying to find something to figure out a way to just dismiss it, right? And this is a pattern that we're going to see more and more of where you have the reality, you have what's actually happening, and then you have Kent's fantasy world on YouTube where he will just present his own account of events that are often wildly different from (laughs) what the newspapers are reporting. (laughs) And another example of what his ex-wife Cindy explained as presenting a whitewashed face to the public so that his donation money will continue. Around this time, people started getting rumblings that Kent's third wife, Cindy Lincoln, had left the Dinosaur Adventureland campus Now, I put out a video around then, and I just want to say that I called it a collection of clips where Kent is talking in what I consider to be subliminal messaging. Wives, that's your job to submit. And if you don't want to, you'll have to see what God says about that and does about that. Because this is something that Kent will do a lot in his videos, because I've seen more Kent Hovind videos than any man should see. And I've noticed some patterns that Kent likes to do. A lot of times when Kent wants to talk about somebody that he's crossed with IRL, what he'll do is he'll get a sort of Bible allegory and he'll tell Bible stories where one character is represented by Kent Hovind and the other person that he's speaking about will be uh, this other character. Job lost all of his wealth. He went from one of the richest men in the world with a family of 10 kids. One day, all his stuff is stolen and his kids die. And his wife turns against him one day. And the Job still didn't curse God. Or if he's having trouble with the current wife, he'll do a seminar talking about how wives should submit to their husband because that was the curse that God put on Adam and Eve. Wives never yell at your husband. God put him in charge. Most of them don't want to be in charge. It's frustrating. But God has to put somebody in charge of the family. He said, Adam, 
You guys messed up. Snake, crawl on your belly. Eve, Adam's the boss. Do what he says. He's given the same seminar <laughs> about wives submit to your husbands over and over again recently. So there were these rumblings that Cindy had left. And then eventually it was confirmed because she posted a long Facebook status and she was starting to post comments on Kent's videos accusing him of basically stealing money from her. And we learned a lot more about that from Cindy posting the video of her financial mediation Zoom call. We're having a meeting with several people involved here. Uh, Ernie Land, a trustee of our ministry, Brady Byram, longtime friend. Cindy Lincoln on the uh, by Zoom. See, the tricky part is that the whole situation with the money is really complicated. And honestly, like I've had Cindy explain it to me before. And it's, it's I mean, it is and it isn't. What is undisputed is that over time, Cindy poured a lot of her financial resources into DAL and CSE in the form of multiple cash transactions as well as the purchase of big ticket items, including at least three vehicles. At the time, I believed Kent Hovind was an exemplary Christian evangelism, and so I trusted his friend Ernie as well. I believed I had a legally binding contract to protect my investment, so I began spending what I promised. Approximately $133,000 of additional funds on top of the 103 dollars I'd already given. That's a total of a hundred and no, excuse me. That's a total of two hundred and thirty-six thousand dollars that this ministry has of my money. Now, by Cindy's own admission, some of this she considered a gift to the ministry. The dispute comes that, from her perspective, some of these items are to be treated as loans to be repaid. Unsurprisingly, Kent and his finance man Ernie consider all of it to be gifts to the ministry which, if true, legally absolves them from repaying anything to Cindy. And of course, they stop making payments. For the record, I, if I owe something, I will pay it. This will be a mess of some third party trying to determine how much was donation and how much was loan. You know, as much as I like Cindy and as much as I feel like I know Kent is generally a liar, it is a, a situation of a lot of he said, she said. Exactly. And compounded with Cindy's ill-advised willingness to allow Ernie to draw up the legal papers on the portions she considered a loan, and just trusting them with their creative language choices. Cindy was calling it an annuity, but Kent and Ernie's paperwork is calling it spousal support. Not only that, but apparently these CSE men slipped in a clause that made payments contingent on Cindy acting as a, quote, biblically submissive spouse. No one agrees to a contract that is contingent on such a subjective performance. Clearly, you hid that contingency from me as well, or I would never have given my money. When you have a contract being written up in a kitchen with Cindy and two other sovereign citizens and no lawyer, I don't really think there's much precedent to this. Cindy may well have severely limited her legal options by signing that paper. Among the many lessons here is to never sign a document involving long-term commitments or a large sum of money without first having your own lawyer take a look. It's a conflict of interest for a lawyer to represent both sides. So if there's only one lawyer involved, then only one person's interests are being looked after. After they talked about the whole financial situation, the topic of the body slam incident came up and Kent said something that I was shocked at. I have studied a little bit, actually quite a bit, karate and judo. And if I body slammed her, she'd still be sleeping. Okay. Which I was like, Kent, what is wrong with you? Why? <laughs> that part stood out to me. And so that was sort of near the end of the video. And this is a pattern we'll see where Kent can't help but incriminate himself. Which brings us up to the point where Ken is arrested. Allegedly. <laughs> Kent disputes that. <laughs> of course he does. On the 19th of July, there's a warrant issued for Kent's arrest. Two days later, Cindy files for a protective order or a restraining order against Kent. And then on July 30th, Kent has his first court date regarding this whole domestic abuse situation. After the court hearing is over, Kent is taken out of the courtroom, fingerprinted and arrested. And then he bails out. He gets the PR bond and he gets out and he goes back to DAL. And then 
A few days later, he puts out a video saying that he's innocent of the body slam situation. He did not body slam her. He's in, he's innocent and he did not get arrested. So that's all. Just so folks know, if they hear rumors, Hovind got arrested. All they did while I was in court for the one hearing, they said, by the way, come next door. We got to fingerprint you. And they just, I just got my fingerprints and left. And not, right. No bond, no nothing. Just anyway, now no, they, they, the, the newspaper article said something about a thousand dollar bond, but um, now, we didn't put up a penny. I don't know where that came from. I think it's fair to say he's lying because the newspapers reported his arrest. You can check the like magistrate documents, the documents of the prison that booked him. And you can even find the bail bond document online that has Kent Hovind's signature on it. Oh, wow. Yeah. He started this uh, section off where he was talking about the court things by saying, when you sling mud at a pig, he loves it. Right. There's some people slinging mud at me. I, got I was thinking, Kent, are you the pig in this situation? Like, <laughs> do you realize what you just said? <laughs> so I, I enjoyed that. <laughs> so a week later, on August 10th, Kent's tech guy, Steve, is arrested for allegedly stealing a car from a parking lot. And it's alleged that Steve was on a cocktail of, of drugs at the time. And the reason that this is alleged is because after his arrest, he was checked into a drug rehab facility. And just like Kent, the, his mugshot was in the paper and it was reported about how he got arrested for allegedly you know, stealing this parked car. What Kent commented about the situation was that because of the drug he was on, he was hallucinating. He thought the cops were after him, so he didn't get in his car. He got in another car, took off. Yeah, which is something we all do, you know. You, you, of course, as one, as you do, as one does. Because if you drive a fancy lifted Jeep, it's very easy for you to accidentally think, "Oh, this cheap truck in a parking lot. This is probably my car, right?" And then fairly quickly, Kent went to the rehab facility and checked Steve out and returned him to DAL against the wishes of many of the residents there. They were not comfortable with Steve coming back so quickly. I think that we all gathered to try to show you that we are here for the right reason. And we're all concerned that he's here, even if it's just for today. Why are you concerned that he's here? Because we don't because trust him. Because we don't trust him, Doc. Oh, yeah, I don't hear you shouldn't be with so why is he here, Dr. Holden? And according to some of the, the people who were at DAL, they say that Steve admitted, you know, when he was being driven to the rehab place by another person from DAL, he admitted to stealing money from the donation box at Dinosaur Adventureland. Now, I can't say if that is really true or not, but right. that was a reason that people that were at DAL were uncomfortable with Steve coming back. And what Kent claimed is that we had a couple of main people who work uh, not they don't work in our ministry, but that we trust them for uh, for vending, you know, to take care of things. And one of them got arrested the other day. And, you know, he's not on staff here, but he's, you know, but, you know, he works for, I don't know, 10 or 15 different companies. And we're one of them. Another rumor I've heard is that when Steve was off at rehab, Kent went into Steve's house and flushed some narcotics down the toilet. We can't speak to the veracity of that at all. But Kent has been recorded as admitting to going to Steve's house just after the arrest and grabbing all of the computers and electronics there. Some of that stuff may have been gained from his other businesses. Well, um, true. So that, okay. were you willing to take that chance? Oh, yeah. Well, I took it all out so that the police can't seize the place over there. I see. It's now here. And I'll say, Steve, OK, let's sort this out. Ostensibly, this was to ensure that Kent could get all of CSE's files and access to passwords. But surely that would also be an obstruction of justice, since the police might want that equipment for evidence in Steve's arrest. Of course, that could well be what Kent wanted to avoid. Who knows what's on CSC's files? And as to what other incriminating materials he may have disposed of, no one will ever know for sure. These things are are uh, legally questionable, like like cops questionable. Like what? Like like what being over at Steve's, clearing out his house with your with your with your sign on the your phone numbers on the side of that van. Why is that? Do you not think these Southern people talk? You don't think uh, they see his face in the picture? Then they see your van out front of his house? Doc, you got to start making better decisions. Now, on a whole different note, we got the new hotshot Young Earth creation advocate, Matt Powell, 
starting to show up and appear on camera with Kent. How does that factor in? Well, Kent has been practically begging Matt to move down to Dinosaur Adventureland for months now. How many are glad Matt's coming to join the team down here? Okay. All right. Sounds great. And to me, he seemed somewhat reluctant to do it. Thank you for joining us. Come visit Dinosaur Adventureland. Matt, get up there, get your stuff and your wife and your kids and come down. What are you doing? Sounds good. We'll, okay. be, we'll be here. But it's official that Matt is moving his entire family, including a newborn baby that he recently had, Maltzatov, down to DAL. <laughs> and a lot of people have been telling Matt, like, don't do it, including atheists, including people who don't really like Matt Powell. I don't agree with the things he says. But as a young preacher, I think he's somebody who's got a lot of talent and he could have a future of success. And I don't really think you want to tie your name to Kent Hovind at this point and put your entire family down at Dinosaur Adventureland when who knows what's going to happen next there. Because if you're looking at the timeline of events here, the dates start to get closer and closer and closer together. And it gets to the point where something happens and then something happens the next day and then the next day and then the next day. No kidding. Fast and furious now. Back to the Kent's assault case. The judge listened to the testimony of Mary Toko, listened to the testimony of other people who had lived at DAL when Cindy was there. Regardless of what you think of everyone involved, it warmed my heart to see Mary and Cindy, who were friends before they met Kent, reunited by the trial. And we are at Pensola Beach right now, just enjoying a little bit of time before I get on a plane and head back home. He saw the documentation from the doctor's office and the chiropractor, and he saw Kent go on the stand, and he saw Kent get cross-examined. And from what I hear, it didn't go well for Kent. <laughs> and I can just imagine. Indeed. So after several days in court, the verdict finally came through that Kent was found guilty of the domestic abuse charges and he was sentenced to a year in jail, but we don't exactly know what's going to happen, but he's supposed to serve 30 days in the county jail. And if he does that, the balance is going to be suspended. So if he shows up and turns himself in on the day that he's supposed to go to the county jail and do his 30 days, then the one year sentence is suspended. But he has to show up and be there on that day. Now, a lot of people seem to think that 30 days is a little light for something this serious. I think it's important to remember that it's only a suspended sentence if he follows what they're asking him to do. So this is what <laughs> is the unpredictable nature about what's going to happen. Because if he doesn't do that... If he says, I'm just going to stay at Dinosaur Adventureland, and if you want me to go to jail, you guys are going to have to come and arrest me. I don't know for sure, but it's possible that there's a fair amount of firearms at Dinosaur Adventureland. Yeah, let's not go there. But the problem is that we saw earlier, Kent could not even admit that he got arrested. He couldn't even admit that he paid to get bailed out. He is convinced that he's innocent. And for him to turn himself in would be an, obviously an admission of guilt. And that's why I honestly can't really say what's going to happen in the month of October. Well, following his pattern, he downplayed the whole conviction with a nothing to see here spin. So sure enough, yesterday, the Co Connecticut County Court over here ruled Hoven's guilty and has to spend, pay a hundred, no, let's say a hundred dollar uh, for be out on bail and, and uh, we're putting it on appeal, so none of this will actually happen, and has to serve 30 days in jail. So also, Kent has to pay restitution to the victim, Cindy Lincoln. He has mm -hmm. to pay for the medical expenses that she already paid for that bill. So she's effectively being reimbursed. But the interesting thing about this restitution is that during the Zoom call, Kent was referencing the bill from the doctor's office his offer was, I'll take her to dinner, give her $1,000 if she'll sign that paper to get one item off the table. Half the medical bill. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. What a, what a sweetheart. What a, what a real romantic. <laughs> and I'm, I'm assuming he would pay for the dinner, too. Like, <laughs> <laughs> So September 21st was when Kent was found guilty. And then the next day, Cindy's restraining order that she had filed for earlier is put into effect. Kent 
is listed on the document as somebody who is considered a risk to Cindy's safety, which I think is totally fair. It says the court hereby finds that the above named defendant is enjoined from threatening to commit or committing acts of abuse as defined in the Protection from Abuse Act. He's restrained from any contact with the plaintiff, which is Cindy. He is restrained from harassing, stalking, or threatening Cindy or engaging in any other conduct that would place Cindy in reasonable fear of bodily injury. And it says the terms of this order shall be effective until further order of the court. So this is an interesting detail because sometimes when people get a restraining order that's passed, it's only until a certain date. So the fact that they decided to say until further order, I think it shows how serious they're taking the situation. And I think that that was the right thing to do. So many days in a row, surely nothing happened the next day. So the next day, Kent makes a video called The Future and presents his new wife, Sandra, on camera. How do you like Dinosaur Adventure Land, Miss Sandra? I do. You do? Okay, have a seat here. He holds the ring up to the camera in a way that had the timing almost of watching a reality TV show. I was so shocked when I saw that. He shows the ring to the camera and he says, I got married again. And he says, Cindy, should have been yours. You blew it. And then she comes on and, you know, they're making some small talk. Kent says, and I married her for money. She has none. Right? I married you for years. Too. I have none also. Okay. <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, except for all the money that is probably rightfully Cindy's, you know, but I <laughs> can't even comment on that. <laughs> so apparently Kent is on wife number four. And this is the same thing he did when Joe divorced him. It's the same thing with Cindy now. Kent is a Baptist preacher and it's very inconvenient for him to present the image of a preacher and not be married. So Kent, when he gets out of a relationship, he rushes into the next one as quickly as he can, even if that means he's not actually legally marrying the person and he hasn't even properly divorced the last one. So this is a pattern that Kent does because his public image is obviously very important to him. So she's defaming my character, which I value greatly. That's why. When Cindy left, Kent didn't give any hint that she was gone. Same thing with Mary. He didn't say anything about it until his hand was basically forced. Okay, that was a big bomb drop. But surely nothing happened the next day. The next day, like I was saying, you know, these controversies are happening faster and faster. Kent was talking about how he gets angry like any normal person does, but he hasn't ever attacked a woman. But for some reason, he then makes this admission. And this is something that Mary Toko had talked about before because she was there when this happened. Kent said that there was, a, he called them a teenager. I don't know if you consider a 13 year old a teenager. I mean, I guess technically. So they were shooting rubber bands because, you know, Kent shows young people how to shoot rubber bands far. We're going to stand here and shoot the rubber band down the center aisle. Go ahead. And the kid had shot me in the face three or four times. I said, look, knock it off. Shoot, aim somewhere else on the body. Last time he shot me in the face, I ran over and pushed him on the ground. I said, don't shoot in the face. Understand? Oh, okay. At first, this might seem like not that relevant, but then it shows to me that Kent is somebody who really can't control his temper. Apparently, when Kent gets upset with somebody, he body slams them to the ground. Kent cannot seem to go a day or two without incriminating himself. And what he said was, I certainly am capable of being pushed beyond my limit, but never with a woman so far. So far. So my hypothesis is that this incident came up during his court case. Mary Toka probably did because she testified she was there. And right. that, I think, could take us into our next detail which was Mary Toko basically breaking her silence with another Facebook post because Mary Toko, after she left DAL, she made one Facebook post talking about why she left and she went radio silent after that for years until now, until she was testifying in court and until this Facebook post. And honestly, I give her a lot of credit. I think it's really great that she came forward and did the right thing in my opinion. To the new wife, hi Sandra. I am sorry I just saw this message. 
can't announce that you are his new wife but he is legally married to Cindy and possibly me still. That is a felony charge. Despite disagreeing strongly with Mary on virtually everything she has to say involving society and health, I think she was a class act in her warning to Sandra on this post. I left for several reasons. I am VP of a 501c3 nonprofit and I know how they are supposed to run. They do many illegal things but he and Ernie lied to cover it up. Reasons? 1. The way Kent handled the money. He said he was a volunteer but he is the reason the money comes in. He was very loose with all this when I was there but now he is really protective with all of this but I have solid proof. 2. He says he is not on the board but he controls the board. He has no planning committee, he makes all the decisions and the volunteer program is really dangerous. 3. Known pedophiles are his friends and they visit often. Kent says they are innocent. 4. People come from all over and they are not properly vetted. He invited anyone and attracts ex-drug and active addicts, homeless vagabonds in the mix of good, Christian people who are looking for purpose and found his ministry. 5. Good Christians come hopeful and leave very disappointed, I know dozens who could tell you I am being honest. 5. When a man who claims to love the Lord can look his wife in the eyes and outright lie, I have no tolerance and he lied to me and many others all the time, even when my well-being was threatened. He is a master of manipulation, denial, and I believe he is being led by the devil. He also has a fuse that will go off and he can be violent. I went to Al to testify in court against him on behalf of Cindy. I saw him violently body slam a 13-year-old boy. Several of us watch in horror as he attacked this young boy like he went insane. It was very scary. You will be his fourth victim. He uses his childlike charm and sex to woo you into believing he loves you. He will be back in court for many other things he has done. I do not want you to be used for his image and hurt like I was. Run away. Seek God and I am sorry to burst your hopes and dreams. It was basically just a formality, but a few days later on September 29th, Kent's most recent appeal on the half-billion-dollar lawsuit was also formally dismissed by the 11th Circuit Court. Right up to this month now, October 1st, 2021, and Kent, as expected, filed an appeal of his conviction on his assault charge asking for a whole new trial. Now, I'm no legal expert, but this filing doesn't seem any more substantive than Bart Simpson saying, I didn't do it. Motion for a new trial. Comes now the defendant, Kent Hoven, and moves the court to set aside the verdict and to grant him a new trial for the following reasons. The verdict is contrary to law. Mm -hmm. Number two, the verdict is contrary to the weight of the evidence that the only unbiased evidence presented was an audio recording of the parties during the incident at issue clearly indicated that the complainant complaint was the uh, initial aggressor to the altercation. She started it, did the whole thing. You listen to it for yourself. Let's see. Uh, Defendant was denied a fair and impartial trial because the court erred in overruling objections to question addressed to the witness. Yeah, going to redo the whole thing, Mr. Nelson. The court erred in admitting testimony of a witness. Yeah, it's not, it's not over yet. I agree there are two sides to every story. None of us were in the room other than Kent and Cindy, so we don't know for sure. Kent deserves his day in court. Last week on October 7th, a hearing was heard in court on Kent's appeal to retry the assault case, but this time with more character witnesses against Cindy. The ruling on this is expected to be on October 13th, which is the day after this video comes out, so stay tuned. Kent took to YouTube not to talk about the important case and ruling, but to take a few shots at me and my viewers. Priorities, I guess. There's 225 replies to my comment on Pelogius. YouTube channel. By the way, Pelogia, anytime. You let me know. We'll schedule a debate. Anytime. Kent seems to have taken Saturday off of new drama, but on October 10th, despite months of speculation that it wouldn't or shouldn't happen, Matt Powell and his whole family showed up at Dinosaur Adventureland, presumably moving in to stay. Are we live right now? Or? You are, you are better than All dead, right. yeah. All right. You just drove in. Go ahead. Yeah, I uh, just drove in on a several-day road trip. Um, so, Father Charles... Uh, we're here. Come visit Dinosaur Adventure Land. Matt and I are going to be doing a whole lot of videos, you atheists. Buckle up. Hang on, okay? I guess I've been warned. Whew. Okay. 
were officially caught up right until now. And it was a lot. So, AJ, what, if anything, have you taken away from this year of Kent Hovind? I started my channel making videos, poking fun at Kent, because I, you know, I like to make videos that are funny. I like to make people laugh. And Kent is somebody who obviously is sort of an easy target. Sometimes his jokes are pretty funny. Kent has made me laugh plenty of times. Sometimes it's not his intention, you know, I'm like, he's just kind of a ridiculous person. But um, recently, it hasn't been as fun. I thought Kent, oh, he's just kind of like a jerk, you know, he doesn't like atheists, he's rude, he calls us stupid, you know, okay. But then, you know, you hear about this stuff with Joe, how he treated his wife and son, Eric, how he publicly shamed them and put them through the ringer and you know, you go back to the the infamous dentist story. And I just have felt like lately, every time I think Kent can't get worse or there can't be something revealed about him or the people he associates with that gets worse every time, it just gets worse and worse and worse. Obviously, it's unfortunate to see what Kent has done, but I think there are good people that have come out of DAL. I think Cindy Lincoln and also Mark Stoney, who have helped me a lot preparing this information because they were actually at DAL. Obviously, Cindy was extremely close to the whole thing. And uh, my heart goes out to both of them, especially Cindy. I think it's terrible what she was put through. I'm just glad to see that she is going to be safe with the protective order. I'm glad to see her getting some restitution because I think she is the victim. And I guess if I could say one last thing, you know, I'll say if you are somebody, or you know somebody who's in a relationship where they're being abused, there are resources that you can call. There's the uh, National Domestic Abuse Hotline, and they also have a website. And that's pretty much it. Thank you, AJ, for all the information you put together for this video. I'm hoping that I can wait until October 2022 before talking about Kent again. So if you want to more closely follow what happens from here, I'd recommend you head over and subscribe to his Atheist Junior channel immediately. (laughs) there's probably an update waiting for you there already. If you've already subscribed and are hungry for more of my Kent Hovind takedowns, tap on the playlist on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Later.